Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 381 for Monday, April 24th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Our sponsor for this episode is HelloFresh.com slash Gig Gab 50. That's five zero. And then you use code Gig Gab 50. You get 50% off of this farm fresh pre portioned ingredients, seasonal recipes right to your doorstep. We've tried it out. We'll talk a little bit more about it later in the episode. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. And today, I am very happy, Paul, that we have uh, a friend of the show back with us and also just fresh back from Nam, Dan East. Thanks for joining us today, my friend. Always, always a gift to get to hang with you guys. I couldn't agree more. We, uh... Uh, we used to we used to get to hang at at trade shows and and so like we got to fix that for next year so we can all be together so that would be good yeah yeah a hundred percent and yeah. you know I'm always listening anyway I'm I'm oh. I'm huge huge avid listener and always you know I text you I yell when I'm yes. listening and I'd be like I gotta text you guys. <laughs> Yeah, Dan, so, yeah. Dan Dan helps fill up the uh, feedback at giggabpodcast.com account. And, and online. And online. Yeah. And you folks yeah. can do that too. Anybody can email us. We'd love to hear from you. And yeah, that's no, it's great. Dan, if, for those of you who don't know, Dan is a uh well, an excellent human, first and foremost, a drummer. Uh and if we actually all three of us have played together, uh, which was uh, some favorite memories. You are a teacher, a producer, uh, an engineer, a, a sound engineer, uh, perhaps much should have been much earlier in the list as well. Uh, very well seasoned musician and all around uh, knowledgeable cat. So I think are, you could put excellent in front of all those things. I, I would like to. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I've been having a lot of fun uh, really working with a lot of the the companies, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about NAM, uh, because I've been working on product development as well. So it's it's fun to wear all the hats. Cool. Yeah. So, all right. So, and that is why we have you here today. I I, I presume our conversation will stay centered around your recent NAM experience, but there's no guarantees, folks. That's kind of how it goes. Um, but let's, let's start with this, because this was... Uh, I you this was I believe correct me if I'm wrong your first time back to Nam since the COVID lockdowns happened uh, in 2020 is that right? Uh, I was there in 2019. Before we do that, I I wanted to mention something just at the top of the show yeah, that man. I I think is important to mention. The last time I was on, which was in 2021, almost I think it was this month or maybe last month. Okay, and I just you know how much I love you guys and how much of a fan of the show I am. And at the end of the show, uh, I, I kind of, I kind of botched it and I, I, I own it because, um, when it came time to say, always be performing and you guys kind of threw it to me, I dropped the ball very deliberately because to be honest, at that time I wasn't performing. It was kind of a dark time came through it not long after that and was actually right back into it fairly quickly. And I think part of it was being on the show that helped me feel like I was doing what I needed to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to apologize to you guys for that moment and to anybody who's listening, who may have well, been it. listening at that point. Um, you know, I feel like as a loyal listener of the show on top of it, you know, it was a, it was an odd moment. So it's on me and well, thanks for saying that. Now. It, 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 uh, and, and we will give you an opportunity in a few minutes to, uh, to maybe have a second shot. Redeem. So there you go. Yeah. Redemption. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How's that work? Yeah. Cool. There you go. So talking about the NAM show, NAM was really, to my surprise, a different experience because everybody wanted it to be the way it was and it will never be the way it was. It wasn't that way after 9 11. It wasn't that way after, 
um, a million things that have that have interrupted it over the years. So how and many for someone who's how many times have you been to Nam? Because at your experience at Nam is sort of by <laughs> definition going to be different than perhaps the average listener's experience there, and that's that's fine. That's right. you, you know, you're you're more connected to the industry. Uh, you've spent a lot of your career in the industry. You worked. Uh, for a long time with Future Sonics, uh, pre- preeminent uh, in ear monitor company. So, uh, like, how many times have you been to NAM? Had it not been for COVID, this would have been my 40th show. <gasps> so, I started to go to NAM when I was on the road as an artist. Okay. And the bus would pull in, and it was insanity. And it was, it was forget the fire marshal. It was chaos. It was debauchery of the level. I remember a band setting up in the hotel, full staging set up in one room, like they had two connecting rooms and blowing the transformer for the whole grid at that time. <laughs> uh, and that's about the tamest story that I think I can tell. We should uh, actually pause here for a second because we're making the assumption <laughs> everybody knows what NAM is, right? Right. So NAM, North American Music Merchants, no, it's ostensibly... It, it was- it used to be the the National Association of Music Merchants. National Association, and then they of music dropped Merchants. it as an acronym, and it became the trademark just NAM. So just it like C- just like C- just like CES, which used to be the Consumer Electronics Show, and now it's not. It's just CES. Right. right. Got it. Yeah. So okay. the the history, Dan, right, is originally it was a place where if you had a music store somewhere, <laughs> you wanted to figure out what to put in that music store. You would go to Nam and walk the aisles and figure out what violins and what you know whatever it might be band instruments, uh, and that's that was that is the original. It was the showcase the exactly, and we used to see each other once in a while when you would go to these things, Paul. And it was great, and yeah. we we used to see each other at MacWorld and then see each other or depending on when it was and and toggle back and forth between the various trade shows Absolutely. at that time of year. The thing about Nam was in the old days you would see different badges. You know, there would be a buyer badge, distributor badge, an artist badge, a vendor badge, an exhibitor badge, and all these different things, press badges and so forth. I was one of those guys that after I was not touring as much and spent my time, uh, when I stopped touring and kind of calmed down my life a little bit, a lot of the companies that I had endorsed as an artist, when I went to them and said, Hey, I'm, I'm, we're not doing, you know, TV and touring as much. I won't be as visible. So just admittedly, I wanted to go to them and say, Hey, I'm taking a step back. I'm not stopping. And every single one of those brands said to me, well, consult for us, you know, the products, you know, the people, you know, the engineers, you know, the musicians. And so that's how I started. My company originally was based on that. Instead of going to work for any one particular company, I so, just helped them all. There's a lesson in here. Like take note folks, right? Like there, there you, you went from touring musician to consultant to many companies in the industry. It, you know, those relationships that you formed early on during your touring days, you can take those with you and, and evolve them folks. Uh, so like, there's a lesson here. Like hopefully there's somebody else out there that, that 10 years from now finds themselves in that same, Hey, I'd rather be home with my family, but I still want to, I'm still going to be in the music industry. This is a, a, a path that has been taken before by at least one guy. And there he is. It, it was really not your, your atypical though, right? Your, your range of knowledge from, you know, being a trained musician to a producer, you know, all the things that you do, Classically trained musician, fair to say? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you have you have an unusual breadth of knowledge that I, I don't know that there's, there are certainly are others, but Dan is unique in the world. Yes. In, no. in how, That's kind of you to say. <laughs> well, the eyes that you are using as you're walking down the aisles at NAM are different, mean different things at different moments. Yeah. I, I started very, very young. I was on TV as a kid and did local TV around Philadelphia and uh then sort of moved up when like the jerry lewis telethon came in and you know became local talent for that and all those silly things that you do as a kid and then i started doing some of the shows they used to call it what became pm magazine was evening magazine in philadelphia that company group w which evolved into all the like hgtv and all that stuff later on but 
all that to be said, I started very young. And when I, I went to high school at the Philadelphia High School for Creative and Performing Arts. So I'd been in music training from the youngest age because I loved it, not because I was forced to. I was just grateful to have a family that was so encouraging. That's awesome. And then went from that to, because I was on my own fairly young a lot of the time, I just jumped right into playing out professionally. And we weren't supposed to. We were, as, When you went to performing arts high school in Philly, we were told that's that's not a good thing. You keep your grades up, whatever. And of course, we all did. We all found gigs. And that's why so many great talents still performing today came out of that school, including The Roots and Boys to Men and, and a million actors and a million other bands that I can name and artists. Um, it's, it's a ridiculous list of who's who music was. So Interesting. going from that to then jumping into a gig as a senior, like literally as a senior in high school that took me on my first, you know, regional sort of a touring thing. We weren't doing anything major, but opening for big bands, big acts, some of which we had no business opening for. So I was thrown into it. And then when that sort of cooled off, what happened was I made the, the choice that I wanted to work in music, period, to Paul's point. That I would, I had the classical training. I had all this formal experience. I had been out there and I realized a lot of the time on some of the gigs, we were the sound check band. You know, we were, I was the youngest one in the band. I was 17 and the other guys were in their twenties, but we, we were a sound check for a, a lot of big hair bands back then, you know, late eighties, early nineties. And I wanted to know more about this. And luckily I had people who mentored me that, that were very kind to me, audio engineers, guys who are now considered legends in the field who back then were just guys out, you know, doing stuff. So road, I started road dogs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I started hauling, hauling road cases for electric factory concerts in Philly. I would pick up any gig I could find to do load ins, to do anything just to, to be a sponge for all that stuff. So it was really cool for this me. Question though, Dan, this is, this is really interesting to me. So what's that like when you're a player and you know, you can play, when you're doing these other tasks, are you itching to be playing? When you're producing, when you're hall, like, like when you're a player, you want to play, right? How how does your heart justify your head that it's okay to do these other things and it's in the music business is the ultimate goal as opposed to being a player? You guys have seen me do this because you've seen me. I've mixed for both of you. Yep, I've played with both of you. I. I try not to be what we call that guy. I try not to be the guy who stands there watching somebody else mix and go, I could do it better. I try really hard not to be the guy who watches the drummer and says, well, I mean, yes, I recognize like you talk about going to shows and you go like, eh, it wasn't quite, but I, I try not to dissect things. Well, you busted on Dave pretty and, bad. Like you, every mistake he made, you were right there. And you, you know, you definitely <laughs> let I, me know, you know, did, like, did I, you, don't, you don't remember. <laughs> I would you, You'd still have the bruise on your shoulder if I had done that. But yeah, <laughs> it's honestly, I, I enjoy the scope of it. I enjoy finding the, I call it panning for gold. And we've talked about this before. I feel like when I go into any situation, anywhere I am, whether it's at an amp show at AES at CES at Macworld when we did expo, like anything, I would find the shiny thing. I would pick up the big tray of dirt and shake it until I found the, the glimmering shining thing. Yeah. And that's how I find everything. And that's really how my, my love for going to NAM started is that when I was really looking for business for my company, I would listen to everything. And sometimes it would be from a big company and sometimes it would be a small company where they would be just a startup and they'd have something really cool. Or I'd find a kid, I have a ridiculously good, I'm grateful for this, track record of finding really amazing, young, talented musicians who are now out in the world doing it at the highest levels. And I found them just walking the halls and uh, there's a wonderful young drummer. His name's Max Nudie, N-U-D-I from Erie, Pennsylvania. And I was with, uh, I won't mention the name of the person. I was with a very well-known drummer and we were walking through the hall and we played this game sort of that we play like 
you can always tell at NAM who the person is because you can tell they sound like themselves. So you can always hear, oh, it's Victor Wooten playing. Oh, it's Stevie playing keys. It's you can always tell walking around who was who. Teddy Campbell, you can always hear Teddy. You know, you immediately hear the way he does his ghost notes and and his yeah. you know very backbeat stuff. And so we're we're walking in and we hear this drummer, like, who do you think that is? And we're trying to guess who it is. And we walk around the corner and it's this little kid. He couldn't have been fourteen, a little skinny kid, really nice kid, good looking, nice kid. And we looked at each other like, uh-oh. Uh-huh. And he looked at me, he looked at me like, I know what you're going to do. And I'm like, yeah. And I immediately walked over and, and met his mother and introduced myself. And I said, tell me, tell me the story. Tell me about, you know, and she said, oh, it's Max. And this was, I guess it was his birthday gift or something to that effect. It, the cut to today, these years later, Max is on, I believe, his third or fourth world tour. Yeah. As a phenomenal, he's a, he's a great player, right. super gifted, you yeah. know, and producer, music director came out of Berkeley, went to, um, uh, he did the summer program at Musicians Institute with my buddy, Stuart Jean, who I've known for years and had managed his band years ago. And so these are the things that I crave when I go to NAMM, I want to find that thing. That's how I found Kickport years ago when I consulted for them and took over their artist relations and I, marketing. I love, I will not play without Kickport now. Yeah. yeah. Toombot is another one, uh, but not just drum stuff. Like yep. all the Toombot stuff, their packaging and uh, uh, most of their materials are booth design. A lot of that stuff was stuff that I did because of my background, as you guys know, through Apple for years and years and years doing design work and all that stuff. So it all lended itself well. Lended or lent? Lent. 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 Okay, Lent. Lent itself. Well, sure. This is what happens when your mother was an English professor. You <laughs> no, question no. your you're, own. You're in your good own company dialect. here, man. Yeah. yeah. So you know, we yeah. go through this. So yeah. in any case, all these things kind of are are the things that I find at Nam. So with all that, having said all that craziness, okay. In 2019, I was there. And it was a really good show. It was a solid show. I had a whole bunch of clients there. Musically, I was back playing. I was mixing all over the place. I wasn't. I didn't want to be tour managing anymore. I didn't need the grief at that point in my life. And then everybody got sick, and nobody knew what it was because nobody knew what COVID was at the time. Oh, wait, and, wait, wait, hold on for a second. We should have a, a moment of, of joint solidarity here that having all been to many trade shows in the past, the concept of the crud going around when you're amongst 50,000 people for three days in a, in a big cement building, there's always the crud. So oh, yeah. This was, this was a different is. crud immediately? Yeah. Yeah. This was, you know, they always called it Namthrax or Namfluenza. Everybody had their names for it. And I was always kind of, everybody picked on me because back even before COVID, I had wipes with me. I had yeah. friends from Japan. Uh, Bubby Lewis, who's this amazing bass player, brilliant, brilliant musician his wife's company made masks back then and we were in conversations about all that stuff for when i was traveling and then a, a whole bunch of people that we know that we mutually know which i won't mention by name uh didn't know what they were sick with so everybody thought oh you have namthrax and it wasn't namthrax it was just something else whatever it was and then uh when it all shut down once we knew what was going on, it was it was pretty devastating. We knew the impact to a certain degree it would have on the music industry as a whole, but nobody saw what would happen with manufacturing across all levels of manufacturing, chip makers, uh, parts manufacturers, literally every component you could think of came to a screeching halt. So people got creative and came up with ways to use inventory, uh, create new things out of things that were were stockpiled, which actually, in some cases, were really cool things. Uh, a couple of the guitar manufacturers found stockpiles of, of old wood from the 70s that had been stored and cured for years and years, didn't know. Uh, another one, another company, uh, I, had, I had been writing for Yamaha for a period of time. I'd been on the roster for Yamaha for years. And because I worked with every product they make, not just band and instrument, drums, live sound, pro audio, commercial audio, but I knew about, you know, I live in Florida. I knew about the jet skis. I knew like I, 
they used to joke, nobody knows more Yamaha stuff than, than Dan does because I, I immersed myself it. in yeah. it. So for me, they came to me at, uh, uh, back then and our mutual friend, Peter Giles had. Hi, had, Peter. Yeah. I, I hope he's watching. I love Peter. He's I saw always, him. He's this, always uh, listening. Yep. I love, he's truly one of the best human beings. And he said, man, have at it. Let's let's take this stuff that's coming in and and make it feel like people are going to want it. That makes it feel usable and make it feel desirable. And that's what we did. Hey, that means I get to tell you about our sponsor, which is HelloFresh this week. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. You get to skip all those trips to the grocery store. And count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. And you can spend less time in the kitchen if you want with the quick and easy meals like HelloFresh's fast and fresh pineapple chicken tacos or falafel power bowls ready in 15 minutes or less. But HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 recipes and over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. There's a ton of variety there. Lisa and I use HelloFresh, and we love it. You know, obviously, like many of you, I'm out gigging and rehearsing often. And when we're home, we like to spend time together. And what's cool about HelloFresh is these recipes come with instructions if we're just cooking something that we normally cook where one of us just sort of drives and the other one is sort of there with HelloFresh, because you get the instructions, you can say, all right, I'm going to take step one. You take step two and you're there in the kitchen working together. It kind of starts that whole communal dinner table experience 30 minutes earlier or 20 minutes earlier while you're in the kitchen cooking. We love it. And you've probably heard us talk about every plate on the show before. Every plate's now owned by HelloFresh. And with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. And it's fun to switch between the brands. And now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with us. Go to HelloFresh.com slash GigGab50 and use code GigGab50 for 50% off. Plus, your first box ships free. So again, that's HelloFresh.com slash GigGab50. G-I-G-G-A-B-5-0 and use code GigGab50 for 50% off plus your first box ships free. Thanks to HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit for sponsoring this episode. All right, so we've we've talked a lot here and, and we've, we've meandered, we've set the stage. I want to, I, let's talk about some of the new shiny, right? You, you, you like the new shiny, what new shiny stuff did you see at Nam this year? Well, I'll tell you what. There were a lot of things that surprised me. The first new shiny thing to mention is a band that I've been following. All right. A band. Al already we've gone in a, a direction I didn't expect to go, which is perfect. Well, I, here's the thing. I didn't know who was going to show up. Sure. The show itself was I. I felt so like it wait, was a wait. I'm gonna I'm gonna back this up. I'm gonna take it. Uh, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll 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 resume here. How much of Nam is what Paul described before, where there's like the what I would call the conference area, where you're looking at gizmos and gadgets and everybody's new instruments and all of that, versus bands playing. Like, what's the what's the vibe? Are bands playing all day long, or is it just bands at night? Right. What's that like? it's it's different now okay. do you can't they have we call the guys the sound police you can't make too much noise in the halls anymore they walk around with decibel meters sometimes they're off-duty firefighters or sure. cops or whatever and yeah, yeah. i had gotten to know a lot of those guys over the years uh the show is about half of its normal size and about half of its normal attendance so when you walked around there used to be like the downstairs we used to call it the dungeon you would find the coolest stuff in the world. It was like it was like being, you know, in the in the the, the uh, tailgating party at a Grateful Dead show. It's just booth after booth after booth, shared booth, little startup companies, and you would find the coolest stuff. And buyers would go down there, and if these guys got lucky, um, they you know they would get either you know a mom and pop brick and mortar store to pick something up which is what usually happened. Or if you were really lucky and you had something super, super cool, um, 
you would you would get a distribution deal or something but, like but, that. But, but, but I, I need to ask the question wander. again. We don't have the we don't have the the same sense of badges. The badges are still the case. You still want to see a buyer badge. You still, yeah, but I I got to I got to back this up because I want to give people a picture of what it's like. So there <laughs> is a conference area. I, <laughs> there are some things that I'm not permitted to discuss publicly. I, of I course, <laughs> of course, and we will leave those out. But but there is a conference area, and then there also are sort of designated places where bands play. Right. And this happens. Yeah, so they've changed this, this. This happens throughout the day, right? Like, Well, like, it's kind of, yes. Okay. It does and it doesn't. So they, the area in front of the convention center used to be just a street. And now it's partially closed wow. off and they and Yamaha sets up the, the Grand Plaza stage, I think they call it, in the middle of the street. And they Got take, it. and it used to focus the sound out towards the entrance, which of course would take it past all the hotel balconies, which was not a good thing, especially on a Sunday morning. Not good. But they did it and it was it was cool. And then they switched it to it aimed back at the center, which of course is this big rounded glass structure, which still made it you know, reflect back. And then there was a secondary stage now that's near the new annex building, the new secondary building that is more recent. There's a smaller stage that has sometimes acoustic stuff, sometimes more eclectic music. And then through that, there is a main stage in each of the two hotels on either side of that street, the Marriott being one and the Hilton being the other, if you know the convention center in Anaheim. Got it. Um, okay, so there's one so on either side of the street. They used to have three stages in each of those hotels. Now there's just one main stage. Got it. So, so there's a handful of stages uh, where bands are playing all day, and uh, like, and 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 then inside the convention center is where there's there's the booths and the the exhibitors, and probably correct me if I'm wrong, but some like uh, sessions happening, people speaking and, and that kind Correct. of stuff. Right. Okay. Standard trade show, standard stuff trade show stuff. Well. Got it. And, okay. So the ses sessions thing, and we do a, sessions yeah, and booths are always cool inside. Uh, and, and then outside is where the performances are happening nowadays. That, that's what it's evolved. Yeah. And there into. are artist appearances and stuff where sure. they'll do signings and stuff. Sure. The thing for me, that's kind of crazy is the other thing for me is I still go in with four badges. This sure, was the course. first year of course you do. they let me have all the badges at once. I didn't have to go and show my ID and then go to another place. and get show yeah, the ID. yeah, yeah. They yeah. were like, oh, I see you get four badges here. So I have a press badge because I'm still writing yeah. and I have yeah. an artist badge for one company and an exhibitor badge for one company and, a, and all these things. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit different. The, the, all right, the, but, but the different carnival, doesn't matter to, to our listeners because they haven't right, been the there before. The carnival is still there. So if Got you it. were the average person walking into this thing, even scaled back the way that it was, you're you're like every tourist the first time they go to Times Square and just looking up and looking up and walking around and seeing all this stuff and hearing this noise and you see celebrities and you see people you think you kind of might recognize. Sure. The difference in being scaled back isn't just that it's scaled back. It's and we've talked about this at other trade shows between the three of us. Is that it's an opportunity to have more one on one time with the companies you really yeah. intended on talking. All right. To so when you say scale back, I, I want to I want to paint that picture. The 2019 <laughs> Nam show had 115,000 registered attendees uh, or uh, uh, people attend. Uh, so you're saying this might have been half of that? It, like, and I guess I I totally grok that. You are going based on your feeling of things around you, and this is not at all an accurate number. But is it somewhere half, a, a little more than half, but but certainly not that that full hundred and fifteen thousand as it felt to you? Right. We have, we have a saying in the record in the old days in the record business: the perception outweighs the reality. Right. The perception for me. I would say fifty percent is being generous. Okay. Yeah, fair. To be honest with you. Now, because some of the major companies weren't there, Gibson wasn't there. If the companies were there, I didn't see them. Fender wasn't there. Sure. Um, Sabian any wasn't idea, there. Any idea why they weren't there? Because nobody wants to spend the money on a show that <clears throat> they can do everything remotely. Then the future yeah. of, of NAM has always been in question. They So there's been a change at NAM because... The president, Joe Lamont, who I've known for many, many years, who is the most wonderful, capable guy in the world, I love him to death, uh, is stepping down. He's done, and it's his time is up. And and so 
we don't know. I know there are people who know more than I do about this. Sure. But as someone who's been going for a long time, and I, I love the fact that I know so many people who do attend and who run the thing. Um, it's, well, it's old home week, right? It's, it's well, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> They, my, the people that I, the people that I have helped get through NAM shows, they call me the mayor of NAM because I literally know somebody at almost every booth when we walk through and the security people and all the administrative people all and right, the right. press people and the whole thing. Lots so of people. When I, I, I want to get back, but I, we got to get back right. to the new shiny no, no, no. stuff. So, so here's, here's the thing. Taking all of that from it. And thank you for, for putting the bumpers in the bowling lane for me. I appreciate <laughs> it. The thing is. And well, you know, we do this all the time. Every time I talk to you, we we tangent like crazy. Uh, yeah. So for me, the thing that I was really looking for was what am I what what am I going to pick up and shake to find what's the shiny what is the shiny thing this year going to be? Is there going to be anything? Right. And for me, two things really were amazing. One was again the the bands, the music that was there. Jameson Ross. <laughs> Incredible. Des- describe Absolutely. the band. Um, he's a, a drummer, soul musician, you know, a, goes back to, to my roots in Philadelphia, just super groove driven. Um, this band called Lawrence, which is a young band or a horn band that is sort of like a funk sort of a, imagine if you took uh, Randy Newman and no doubt and smashed wow. it together. Wow. And it's All a right. brother and sister. And their father was Mark Lawrence. Mark Lawrence was a producer who did a bunch of movies, Two Weeks Notice and something else, the rewrite, a bunch of things. He was a, a guy. And these kids are super talented. And they put together this band and they did through lockdown, they did this wild social media stuff. And got all this attention, and their shows are just so much fun. And they were the headliner. One of my favorite things to see. A, a, a musician, a few musicians, but one in particular, Ali Handel, who's a wonderful singer songwriter, uh, super cool person. And we had years ago sat down and talked about actually doing a podcast and it, we just, everything that happened after sure. that. And she plays guitar in an all female Aerosmith tribute band called the rag dolls or rag. Dolls. <laughs> and they That's are a great name, the highest level of tribute band. Like when you think about, you know, tribute bands like Journey and Pink Floyd, these, this is the, the anointed, this is, they have the blessing. In fact, Joe Perry was just with them. Like, this is not just an Aerosmith tribute band that happens to be all women. This is a killer Aerosmith tribute band. I don't care if you don't like Aerosmith when they come out and they take you through the timeline and the first song, you kind of go like, I don't think I know this one. And they progress through And it's really, really, really good. Really, really good. They were really fun to see. Um, this band called String Revolution, which is a super cool band. Um, they are an acoustic thing. Okay. It was started by Janet Robin. Janet Robin, who I think Paul may have met with me once. Janet was uh, Randy Rhodes' protege, who oh. then oh. started as a solo artist in L.A., uh, Became the lead guitar player for Lindsey Buckingham's band at the height of his thing. Played with Meredith Brooks. Like, wow. she's very credible. And then as a solo artist, was touring and doing all this stuff. And then she's joined by Marcus Ilko and Robert Luis to create an acoustic thing. They do Beatles tunes, but it's very... It's huh? it's at that level of John Jorgensen, Tommy Emmanuel kind of stuff. Like, really... Wow. And first so the, class these, musicianship. These four bands are bands that you saw performing yeah. in these outside. All performing. performing. Yeah. And yeah. Just I want to know about products, Dan. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I'm yeah. going gonna, gonna to throw you a, a curveball here. I, I just want to hear about the, the stuff. So okay. cool bands. So, I get it. Because we got it. We, you, we like our listeners, oh. we, and also by, by proxy, our listeners love gear gab. So get us into some gear gab. Okay. Band. A new feature. So, Dan says, take my money. <laughs> what is what what does Dan say take my money to? Man, I'll tell you right now, if I had the money, the thing that that probably probably boggled my mind most was DMB Audio Technic. Uh, my buddy Mark Rush kept saying, you gotta come check this out. DMB Audio Technic for me is the best loudspeaker company in the world, period, bar none, the finest. 
I listen to L Acoustics. I listen to View Audio Technic. I listen to EAW. I very, very familiar. I go to USITT. I listen to the shootouts where they A, B, all the systems. For me, my personal taste, there is no better live sound reproduction than DOB Audio Technic. I love their stuff. I am not on their roster. I don't work with them. Sure. But every time I hear their stuff, I go, what, what is this? Like, oh, it's a DMB Y system or it's a whatever it is. Yep. I've, in my lifetime, I've been fortunate to both mix and play through their systems, through playing at the Fillmore and stuff like that. They have this thing, the, the new thing everybody's jumping in on is this immersive audio, this immersive you know, three-dimensional sound where it spins around oh. your head and you have placement. This was something that we did years ago with Herbie Hancock, who wanted to have multiple speaker systems and joystick controller to be able to place a mono instrument in various parts of an arena or a venue. This is a whole different thing. What, what is this called? This is called Soundscape. Okay. DMV Audio Technica, Audio Technic has this thing called Soundscape. And it is a different level of immersive listening mm. because even though it's a few years old, needless to say, it's now really coming out at a much higher level. And one of the benefits of using this isn't what you would think for like, yeah, it's great. You can create a home audio theater, home theater, whatever. You but this would, would this be used like this? Yeah. This for refits. Let's say, for example, you want, your your venue, your concert venue, to sound like where the Vienna Symphony performs. It's one of their demos. You can recreate the listening environment Got it. through the use of this system. All right. So, I, but th this is awesome. But this is something stunning, for. But I don't have deep enough pockets. Yeah, for this, th but this but isn't something. This isn't something any of us is going to buy. It's cool. What's, well, you will. Oh, you will oh. because in its infancy. Yes, we're just starting to see variations of this from a, a bunch of consumer companies Got it. and in 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 ad, advanced consumer and in some of the entry level. Once the pricing on this becomes attainable and the AI kicks in and all the other things, this will be the next the next level. One okay. of the, uh, the all right. there were some really cool things that came of this and you can see from what they did because it was a scaled down demo in a listening room. Sure. The, where the applications for this will trickle down into every venue you can think into of. Things there's that so we can, many ways that we get to oh, touch. There's so many yeah. cool ways to do it. Plus, listening without having to turn it up, you don't have things bouncing off the walls in the same way. Okay. Next thing, um, and you know, obviously for ears, for in ears, Here Technology has been a company I've loved for a long time. I've worked with them for a long time. They're great people. Uh, they have a new digital version of their Hearback Pro uh -huh. that lets you not only assign everything you want and do groups of what you want, and it's Dante compatible, and it's got Waves compatible, and it's all these things that you can do, but it has a built-in comm so the band can, you can talk to each other over the ears. It has, uh, you, it has a little hidden feature where you have uh, a compander and uh, uh, a, a really can control and brings in some of the really high-end, huh. large-format mixing features to your own little personal mixing station. It's beautifully done. It's easy to see on stage, which I really yeah. like. The, the, the panels are just beautiful. The thing that makes this such an amazing thing for me is the, the amount of trouble that, that they put into picking knob controllers that when you're all sweaty on stage, if you reach over, feel really solid and your hands don't fly off of it. I, so I've, that was yeah, that's I've a heard, really cool one. I've heard from from quite a few friends that use the Hearback Pro that like on stage, like it it is absolutely the product of iterative design. Like they they yep. have continued to make this thing just exactly what it needs to be to be useful on stage without it being cumbersome. So yeah. Yeah, now, here's yeah. another thing about it that's really great is that unlike most of the other manufacturers, the headphone amp section of this thing is really substantial. Yeah, so you can drive high and and Sears, head full size cans for studios. It's great. It's yeah. a really it's a really good system. Uh, another thing that kind of boggled my mind here is a couple of the keyboards. Yeah. Did you get to check out the new expect. Nord one? The new Nord is spectacular. 
That's the stage because four, what correct? Did, the stage four. So yep. what they did is they not only did they improve the, the interface of it and the navigation on it, but the feel is better. It feels good. The new effects section is great. The processing is, is better. The voicings are better. You can, on the 88 key, four balanced outputs off the back. Wait, so what? You can, yeah, so you can plug right into your snake. Now, I like a transformer myself, which is another product that I saw that I love. But um, it was really amazing to, to see this keyboard. Now, they've done this before. The Stage 3 was capable of having four outputs. But not like this. This was a whole different, this was a whole different thing. Huh. Um, it just feels beautiful. I, I had a conversation with somebody about this because a lot of worship environments and a lot of, of keyboard players, you know, everybody would love to have, you know, a grand piano and a and a B3 and a Leslie with them on stage, but it's not. It's not effective. That's not feasible. Yeah, no, no, no. no. But no, the Nord, and- Nord now in the stage four has a level of both usability, audio quality, and expansion possibility with a really substantial uh, processing capability. Yep. It's one, really nice. It's beautiful. One, one thing that uh, as, as a person who listens to keyboards more often than he plays them, either because I, they're on stage with me and I hear them in my ears or I'm mixing a band and I, you know, have to uh, mix because I'm hearing it coming out of the mains is that Nord has figured out and they, they figured this out a number of years ago and I'm sure it's still true with the stage four. They have figured out how to make these sounds cut through a mix without sounding brittle or harsh or anything. That's like right. they, they, it they're like smooth. They're they're very, very smooth. it's totally smooth, but when you press a key on there, you don't have to worry about, you know, one patch being significantly louder or softer than the other. It like, it sorts all that stuff. They have sorted all that stuff out and it like you pay, you get what you pay for and you pay for what you get. However, what this means is with the stage four being out that stage threes are going to be coming out on the used market for a decent price. And that stage three is doesn't quite have all the you know niceties that they've added to the four, but it is a workhorse of a keyboard. So either look for the stage four if you've got the cash, or take a look for a used stage three because people tend to take care of these things. So hey, uh, hey yeah. Dan, yeah, yeah. Were, were there any guitars at this show? I just I'm oh, curious. The, so here's the thing about the, the guitar presence. I will say was was less than I think I've ever seen. However, there were some luthiers that were there. Um, I, I work with Michael Tobias Design, MTD. They had a wildly successful show uh, for their basses, and they do have guitars, and they're, they're both their custom line and their Kingston line. I mean, to give you an idea of how well the show went for them, they their entire inventory was sold out the first day before noon. Wow. Uh, you can't show. sell at the show, but all the buyers literally yeah. came to them and wiped out everything that potentially would have been. I mean, it was really spectacular. And they have, you know, some of the best players in the world. Their imports, their guitars and their basses, but they're, of course, known for their basses. They have a new uh, Lynn Keller signature model that is absolutely beautiful. It's just spectacular. Um, Yamaha had some great guitars, and I, I admittedly go either way with their stuff. And these were really felt beautiful. Uh, Yamaha has this way that they can advance the the drying and aging process of the woods so that the woods can then have a real feel. And they do this in their silent, they call it their silent cello and their silent uh, upright and all these things. But the woods that they use are, are aged in such a way that they feel like they're worn in. Yeah, are they, we talking about uh, electric guitars or acoustic guitars? Yes. Oh, Both. electric guitars. Oh, yeah, okay. they've done a they've done a really nice job. Interesting. Um, I would think I would think I've that hoped for for more guitars. I'll tell you who the company that stands out for me for acoustic guitars is this guy uh, Isaac Yang uh, J A N G. Absolutely, some of the most impressive acoustic guitars. I I always impressed with his work. But not nearly the guitar presence. A lot of pedals, definitely yeah. a lot of pedals. But yeah, yeah. I I didn't I wasn't feeling the guitar vibes like I usually do. 
I would think that there's actually a good opportunity because, of course, Gibson and Fender bring the big booth and you know all the great demo demonstrators that would come in there. But there seems to be like a a reverberation of you know the disintermediation of having the internet to get you launching a product. It yeah. seems like it's a good environment. You know, there's a whole kind of custom acoustic luthier stuff. There's a lot of really amazing small manufacturers. And yeah. you know, the thing, I guess the thing is they don't they're not really looking distribution so maybe it's not the right place for them right? they, they don't make enough right yeah. well uh, that's true i think fender has some brilliant new guitars this year they, they have do. some absolutely spectacular they wised up yeah. they reverse engineered their own stuff and came up with a way to change the technologies and look they went through some growing pains and they shed some dead weight and they did made some good decisions in my opinion was there any buzz about the lack of fender and gibson being at the show and like 100 percent, and that that Yes, it's too expensive for big manufacturers. It's a reflection on NAM, or was it more a reflection on Gibson and Fender? Gibson's pulled out before in the past, and uh, Gibson, through what they went through before lockdown time, and they're all the situations that they were in and acquiring other companies and things that Gibson got themselves in and out of, uh, not the least of which was going through some pretty rough stuff, floods in Nashville and all those things. Um, I think it was a wise move on their part to yeah. take the step back. Uh, I missed seeing them because they always do an interesting job. No, I didn't see uh, Roland. And that's not to say that some of these companies, that, and I apologize if some of them were there and I just didn't get to see them. It's sure. a big um, show. Yeah. I, it, as, even as a scaled down show, I tried to see as much as I could. As an example, Yamaha, which normally has the massive ballroom in the Marriott, they had taken one of the ballrooms in the convention center that was would have been occupied by one of the other companies, and they used it to, I don't know this officially, but the way it appeared to me was to only show new product, um, which actually was really cool because that's really what people wanted to see anyway. Um, they had some cool stuff. So just to kind of circle back. My in keyboard world, the second thing that I, I have to give respect to is Hammond. Speaking of Hammond, their XK4, if you want the real deal Hammond sound, again, the classic Hammond, but all the stuff everybody really wants and loves, much better processing. Huh. They, they did a great job. Um, and, it, shift gears and, a little. It, and it only weighs like a third of what a B3 weighs. Or yeah, less. That's great. And it's <laughs> and you don't have to worry about, you know, the, it's it's a different durability factor. Yeah. It's a different, you know, that's the, the thing about this. And and I gotta tell you the truth, you know, speaking of the keyboards, and I had this conversation with somebody the other day. You know, when you think about everybody would love to have a grand piano and a and a B3 and a Leslie, everybody who would love to have a 12-piece acoustic drum kit, especially in the worship world is now starting to realize that this new generation, and we did see some really cool stuff at the show, the new electronic drums are a whole different ball game. Really? And in terms of the playability and feel of the kit. Yeah. And because you have 100% volume control, any size gig, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it doesn't feel the same. It's not the same deal. Yeah, it, that's right. But... You never have to buy heads. You don't have to worry about replacing your cymbals. You don't have to worry about going out of tune when, you know, you're in a humid place or in an arid place or whatever. And the, yeah, there's this pros and next, cons. Yeah. Yes, correct. As a drummer, I resisted it for the longest time. This is the first time uh, Yamaha sent me a kit that sounded so mind-blowing. I had no idea this new series of DTX that they have. But here's the big game changer. Yamaha, in particular, you can order either the silicon or the mesh heads. You have your choice. That's right. great. That's a nice little feature. That's nice. The yeah, real feature sure. is that you can have all your drum samples now on a flash drive and not have a MIDI interface. And you can plug a thousand snare drums right directly into the module and run your poly samples right off your flash drive. Right on the DTX interface. So the, yes, sir. So, so you don't. Oh, so you don't have to bring your laptop with you or whatever tone bank it would nope. have been. So it's smart. It's really, really nice. And this That's series smart. has 
they have eight balanced outputs. So for live now, oh, so you can you, have you're individual not running, sends. You're you yes. don't have to mix yourself on stage. Essentially, nope. It's um. really really impressive. Now follow that with this new company, uh, um, F Note E F N O T E. They okay. have um, that's our TC Pros. Uh, I think distributes them. They have a new stage box for their kit. Now, their kit looks exactly like an acoustic kit other than the symbols. Okay. The symbol material is different than Roland and Yamaha and everybody else. It's a, it's a porous silicon blend. I think it, it could be just rubber, but it looks like silicon to me. But the feel is much more natural. Definitely bounce here. And you have to be used to the electronic feel of them. Yeah. But... They now have a pro stage box that's a 12 bus XLR balanced box that sits next to this kit. Wow. That is the difference between somebody noticing and not noticing that you're playing a digital kit. Huh. Um, yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking thing, at a picture of it online. We'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes, folks. That's the thing really that I really like about this kit is that you would look at it and be like, you know, I really I really only need the five-piece kit. Sure. But then you realize that if you play with a sampler or an SPD, you know, a Roland or whatever, you can just assign whatever you want. It's a big control service that That's all looks it is. like. So it you decide, like I want yeah. this floor tom to be my my drop sub bass, whatever, my yeah. 808 or anything. I want it to be my cowbell. Or a Doesn't hand matter. clapper. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You now have everything you need right there. And it, it's, it really is a beautiful kit. It sounds right. great. Very nice people. They did a really good job. Huh, cool. Um, now shift right. from that to my favorite, one of my favorite companies, as much as I love DMB audio technic, I love Rupert Neve, his company. I, I loved him. I love the company. I love what they do. They now have an eight, a rack, an eight, an eight unit DI rack. So that if you don't have the stage box or you need to have, you know, a string section or oh. whatever you need, you have eight Rupert Neve DIs in a single space rack. Interesting. Transformer. They are the most beautiful. If and this is built to be a stage box. Well, it can be for anything. I mean, I it mean, could be for a studio. For, but, the, but for the price, when you think of it this way, okay. You know, if you look at like a radial direct box, you know, they're all around a couple hundred bucks. Is it, are we, are we talking about the RNDI 8? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I have the right thing for the, the, the show notes. Yep. Okay. I, I always joke that if, if, if Neve had designed flip flops and they called them the R N F F dash two, I would buy 10 <laughs> pairs of them because I, there is nothing that Neve makes that I have not just been completely in love with, uh, including, you know, their preamps and everything yeah. else. So they have this thing. I love the R N D I as a direct box. I think it's just, what it does and the way it sculpts the sound and gives you the just the widest possible, most beautiful transparent sound is it's one of my favorites. There are others. I use a bunch of different ones, but sure. in terms of in that price range, in the under three hundred dollar price range, right. an R N D I is amazing. So we've hit keys, guitars, uh, speakers, a couple of other things, there. drums. Okay, so obviously. Mixers. Mixers. I was going to say, okay. we, we have time for mixers. So talk, yeah, talk I, about mixers. Yep. So Yamaha introduced this thing called a DM3. Okay. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people were standing around with their arms folded saying, oh yeah, you know, DM3, you know, they're competing with the, with the M32s and the, no, that's not what this is. Yamaha doesn't, put anything out easily or lately. They wait until everybody else puts their thing out and then they figure out what they need to do to it. Where, I mean, that, where have I heard that's, that before, that's, a, that's an Apple thing <laughs> right there. Yeah. That's that exactly before? right. So this DM3, and it has a Dante option built in, okay. is a small footprint, super small footprint mixer following suit to what SSL did, following suit to what a lot of the, a lot of the other manufacturers did. But this is 100% a pro-level console. It has all the features of the large format consoles in this itty-bitty little thing, this tiny little yeah, desk. It's, it's got like little it's eight faders or something. But no. 9624 console but it's that not... works with all the other Yamaha. It talks to all the other desks. It's under $2,000 with the Dante. 16 mono, one stereo, and two, I think, two stereo effects. 
Um, yeah, so it's limited on inputs. It's got it, yeah, sixteen inputs, um, twelve XLR, and then four combo jacks, XLR TRS jacks, um, with and two eight, matrices. Okay, it's eighteen in and out on the USB interface, so yep. you can run it with the DAW. Yeah, but think about this for most live fans streaming for are a club. Be fine. Think yeah. about this for running you know, for running your ears. Think about it for, I mean, I love it for broadcast mix. I think it's mm. awesome for broadcast because you you can take, you can send your groups from your main console or your buses and send those and, and have full control. It's, it's just rock solid. Interesting. The tactile feel of this thing. Just, it's just as solid as it can be. It is just a stunning piece of technology and it just sounds great it really sounds beautiful i'm huh. really impressed i i did not know what they were going to do sure because you know how do you i mean their own consoles are are a little long in the tooth now and i love don't get me wrong rivage is my first choice i love the pm10 for everything i love a lot of consoles but that's that's my my go-to neve prance but, but this i mean that's this, all i gotta say you know yeah this works for for our audience yep. here like this is this, so, this serves this yeah it i mean for under two grand it's it's a spectacular piece. Huh. It is absolutely a professional console in a small footprint. Um, Yamaha they they introduced some new drums. By the way, speaking of the drum stuff, acoustic drums. They did something really cool with their stage customs. Stage co custom is sort of a midline yeah. kind of a kit. When they changed the design, and this is something again from having inventory. I don't know how they came up with this to take this birch kit. Yep. And now change the finishes and change the way they, they set up the hardware. But now they have all the different depths so that you can have a customized kit at a price that, that oh. is amazing. And they sound absolutely so they, fantastic. Th these aren't customs in that they, I mean, I, I know they use the word custom, but but they've got these depths in inventory. When we're talking about depths, we're talking about the... Uh, th there's there's the width of the drum, which is the circular part that the head goes on, and then it's how deep is the shell and right the distance so you can from mix top and to match bottom. for each drum. What's that? Yeah, and you yeah. can you can you can order. And the thing that's really nice about that is for certain types of music, you want your pitches to be voiced to each other differently. Yeah. So it's not just the depth of the size; you want the relative interval between the two drums to to match up and be musical. You know, that's a that's a key thing. So that was really cool. Um, All right, it, it, uh, we got we have time, maybe time yeah. for one more thing. Now that was actually right. supposed to be the DM3 mixer, but we're here. So one more thing. Okay, Pick I gotta tell down. you, I got a I got a really good story for you guys. So this was this was probably one of the highlights of this whole trip. Before Nam starts, I'm out there working. I spent the whole week there. I had work to do and I had gigs and stuff, and I always look forward to it. I go. Before NAMM starts, I go to get a little workout in the morning. I'm I'm away from downtown Anaheim. Um, I go and work out. I'm all sweaty. I'm sitting in this little restaurant having breakfast in a t-shirt and shorts. And I'm sitting there and the gentleman walks past the table, very well dressed, and stops about five feet and turns around and looks at me. And he walks over to the table and says, this is going to sound so bizarre. I feel like I'm supposed to talk to you. And I said, okay, Los Angeles, whatever. I don't know. I said, okay. And this has happened to me before. I said, okay, why do you feel like you're supposed to talk to me? He said, I, I don't know. Uh, do you know anything about audio? I said, yes. He said, do you know, do you know anything about design in, in commercial product? I said, yes. He said, do you know, you know about guitars? And I said, yeah, I do. And he proceeds to tell me that he's here to go to Nam, and I then tell him, of course, I'm going there, and that he he just had to explain this, and he didn't know why he was telling me this, but he wanted to tell me what I what I just hear him out, and he proceeds to tell me about this this in really impressive design that he has, and of course, I know what he's talking about. I understand the transducer technology. I understand all this stuff. And as he explains it to me, I said, uh, do you have the patents on all this stuff? And he says, yes, I do. I said, do you have them with you? He says, yes, I do. And he hands them out. I said, please have a seat. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, and what 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 is this thing that you're teasing so, up here? 
this gentleman who is a very, very nice guy is, is this thing called the Eminent Model 20. And this thing, the, to, to summarize this as best I can, is a guitar amplifier that looks like a picture frame you would hang on the wall. The How? whole amp, the whole thing. Like, so just like an inch or two thick? It's it's like 20 pounds. It's 32 by 20, maybe 22. It'll run on as little as 20 amps, so you need almost no real muscle to drive it. It is a little pricey now at the at this point, but it's sure. very efficient. This is designed by, by Bruce Thigpen, who's developed a million things. And the company's called Model 20. It's model20.com. The way that this thing sounds, I went to their booth and this looks the long amazing. Of it is we had this great I'm looking conversation. at the picture now. I can't, I cannot fathom. And it's, it's literally like two inches thick. The, sound. the reason why this is patented is because it doesn't generate a waveform in the traditional sense. And I won't bore you with all of it. But the bottom line is, is that it's a non-reflective output. There are other companies that have worked on things like this, but patents are what? How long does a patent last? Seven years? Whatever it is? Uh, it depends. It could last a lot longer than yeah, that. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, it depends yeah. on what it is. But I'm saying, depending on how this has come about. So these are emitters, unlike traditional technology, so that the, the way that the sound distributes itself is not in the traditional end-over-end -end wave development. And I, I'm doing the quickest job that I can of explaining this because it <laughs> was it's, it's so just... It sounds Incredible good. Incredible sound. Like it drives. It, it, yeah, it, it really it, sounds. It, it, it really competes. sounds good and in a non-directional way. Oh, really? So that you can have it right next to you, right behind you. Yeah, that's the difference oh, in this that's way compared better. to a traditional loudspeaker. Yeah. You can have it and and hear it very, very well no matter where you are. It's so really this, a, they're, they a seem to be They seem to be marketing this for guitar, as a guitar amp, but. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll, great for keys, great okay. for, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So th this is why someone would go to NAMM. This is it. This, this, is was, it. this was my shiny it, thing in the big pile of dirt. You win, Dan. You win the night. This is exactly like, you know, you search the aisles, you see the big guys, but then you turn the corner and you see something you've never seen before. That is why events exist. And actually, I'm going to close us with this. Uh, as you well know, I was in a previous life associated with a very big, very, very popular event that went away almost overnight, despite the enduring love of all the thousands of people who would go there. Nam, like you hear Dan, he's still got a twinkle in his eye when he talks about the personal connections, the technology discovery. Every musician you talk to that's been to Nam cannot wait to go again. Every musician who's never been there can't wait to go there someday, right? People want NAM, but it takes more than that for an event like that, of a huge event. E E3 just closed its doors, yeah. the, you know, the biggest gaming event, right? Uh, Macworld had its time, you know, did what it did for a while. Once upon a time, there was a computer show that was 150,000 people called Comdex that went away, right? Yep. So despite the love of the people who want this thing to exist, you hope that economic situations, you know, surviving the disintermediation of, of how media gets their news about things. You hope a whole bunch of factors can align again. Shows can get second winds. I mean, there, there's other stories about shows that were on death legs and then found a new life in them. And as sure. a musician, hearing my buddy Dan so effusively praising the experience, we hope that Nam you know, finds what it needs to be to get the Gibsons and Fenders back and get all the boutique manufacturers back and all the innovative stuff that goes there. You really hope that it just finds another life and it hits another gear and goes on. So Dan can be going for another 40 years. But that, yeah, this, that, that needs to happen in order for the gravity to exist, to bring all the people there, including the, and I'm going to say little guys like eminent technology to show off this little thing that that potentially could change the face of the way we do things, uh, you know, over the next decade, which is amazing. Yeah. And by the way, just as a footnote to that, since music Mesa is no longer a thing, we need Nam. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we need to have this Viva show, the damn. Yeah. show, you know, yeah. so Viva it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. Dan, thank you for hanging out with us, folks. Thank you for hanging on with us. 
It only took you an hour, folks, to get from the front door of NAM to the golden nugget of this uh, eminent technology. And hopefully there were some fun things that you learned along the way. Dan, thank you so much for hanging with us and oh, hey, coming Dan. back and, uh, and telling us all about this. Dan, what is it that we always say at the end of the show? Um, wait a minute. Uh, always be performing. Hey! That's it. Woo-hoo! <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> See you next week, folks.